Al Jazeera Podcasts. On regular days, journalists at Ecuador's TC television station in Guayaquil go about their business as normal, putting out news broadcasts. But last Tuesday was no ordinary day. Thirteen masked gunmen stormed the station during a live program. We're in air, so just so you know that you cannot play with the mafia. Station employees lay on the ground in fear for their lives as the chilling scene continued to be broadcast. Soon, the images made their way across the world. The attack was the most visible example of a wave of violence across Ecuador. Now, President Daniel Noboa says the country is at war with gangs. But is it a war he can win? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. For about 15 minutes after the gunmen stormed the TC television station, the channel continued broadcasting live. Viewers watched the attackers issue threats while keeping the channel's journalists hostage. All 13 of the gunmen were later arrested, and authorities say they'll be charged with terrorism. Nobody was hurt in the incident, but Jorge Rendon, deputy director of news for the channel, spoke out in its aftermath. First of all, I want to thank God we are alive because it was an extremely violent attack. They shot our cameraman in the leg. Another person was shot in the arm. And Al Jazeera's Alessandro Rampietti said it wasn't the only attack that week that's rocked the nation. He spoke to us from the city of Guayaquil. People are fearful, they're anguished, they're still in shock about what happened. And there's no doubt that there is fear on the streets. We visited one of the main covered markets in Guayaquil, and many of the stores were still closed. The people who were there working said that they didn't have other option but to work, but that there wasn't much yet in terms of street traffic. And so while we were trying to go back to normal, they understand that they will have to face a long road ahead. While the attack on the station captured a lot of viewers, the crisis didn't start there. Alessandro says Ecuador has now become one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America. This latest crisis started when President Daniel Noboa attempted a crackdown against the gangs. Many of these gangs control uh, much of the country's prisons, and he was trying to move some gang leaders, in particular one of them known here as Fito, who is the top leader of Los Choneros, one of the two main gangs operating in the country. When the policemen entered the prison where Fito was, they discovered that he had disappeared. Ecuador has launched a nationwide operation to locate a drug lord who disappeared from jail. He's not just any escapee. He's the leader of one of the most powerful drug gangs in Ecuador, who vanished overnight from a high-security jail. And not only this, but then there was essentially a series of apparently coordinated and simultaneous attacks across the country, car bombs going off, attacks on universities with armed men scaring students, running in the streets. Across Ecuador, fiery blasts rocking multiple cities, one engulfing a police car. The wave of violence beginning just hours after Ecuador's president declared a state of emergency. Fito, the gang leader, was found missing from prison on Sunday. On Monday, President Neboa declared a state of emergency. 
This was the day before the station attack. Ecuadorians. Ecuadorians, the time has come to put an end to drug trafficking, hitmen, and organized crime dictating the government what to do. What we are seeing in the country's prisons is the result of the decision to face them. Naboa was just elected in November. The security crisis is seen as a major early test of his presidency. He sent the military and police into action. A state of emergency gave the army sweeping powers to intervene inside the country's prisons and around uh, the country in general against the gangs. This has been quite efficient and successful, really. There was a major issue with over 100 prison guards and other prison staff members that were being held by inmates inside these prisons. But then later in the week and over the weekend, the soldiers were able to raid the prisons and free these guards successfully. And the feeling is that the gangs pretty much surrendered, at least for now. To understand how things got to this point, we have to understand how powerful the gangs are. So we spoke to Marcel Matosifen a German-Ecuadorian filmmaker who made a documentary on the gangs in Ecuador that came out last year. Ecuador, step by step, became uh, a paradise for all the international crime. We have around 25 street gangs in the streets of Guayaquil and all along the coast started to fight each other. And when the huge wave of crime and assassination started. Ecuador used to be one of the safest countries in South America, and now they're leading with about 45 killings per 100,000 inhabitants. We can now say this country is a narco-state. The prisons are controlled by the gang leaders. Yeah, they they basically retreat into the prisons because it's there where they can be safe and not fear the other gangs because they don't fear the police. They do only fear the other gangs and to be killed by the other gang leaders. In a failed state, the biggest problem is impunity. The international crime organizations manage to infiltrate the legal system and with money and with threats and threats, they managed to create a state of fear where everybody who has the power and the money is able to get away with everything they want. Police officers are under-equipped, the gangs are highly armed, and this creates a situation which is this spiral of violence where a state is basically not functioning anymore. Alessandro says it's the drug trade that's made gangs so powerful in Ecuador. Ecuador was considered a relatively safe and stable country, and especially when you compared it to drug-producing neighbors, uh, Colombia in particular, but also Peru. But that has been changing in the last decade or so. And throughout these years, The increase in power of these gangs has also meant an infiltration into state institutions, high level of corruptions by which the organized crime has been able to co-opt and pay off uh, judges, politicians, and in particular, when it comes to controlling prisons. So what needs to be done, obviously, is to try and dismantle these gangs and the power they have. So can President Naboa really do that? That's after the break.
Ecuador's president, Daniel Neboa, has declared a war on gangs, enlisting the support of the military and police. But in some ways, he was never expected to be here. President Noboa is 36 years old. He is the son of one of the richest men in uh, the country who had run for president five times and never made it. He's the heir of a banana empire, which is quite cliche, (laughs) but it's like the real banana republic. Alessandro says he wasn't expected to win. But last year, an assassination threw Ecuador's election wide open. The killing of Fernando Villavicencio, a leading candidate in the last presidential elections, was a turning point in Ecuador. Security has taken center stage since the August 9th murder of Villa Vicencio, a former investigative journalist and lawmaker who was gunned down while leaving a campaign event. That's something that had not happened here. And also it sort of opened the eyes of everybody to the fact that these uh, gangs um, were not afraid anymore, you know, to, to do something as evident as killing a presidential candidate. So that definitely was a major turning point. This really opened the door for the possibility of somebody who was promising to truly crack down on the gangs to win, which was the case. But now that Neboa is really carrying that crackdown out, we ask Alessandro whether his hardline approach is the answer. Obviously, no. The, the solution will not come from the hardline alone. Obviously, there's got to be some of that. It was a bold move by Daniel Noboa to declare the state of internal war that allowed the military to act, uh, something that previous presidents were wary about doing. But I think that that's what the people wanted. The state, I think, needed to show that they could have the upper hand. The problem is, as uh, many analysts have said this week, the strategy so far lacks an exit strategy, and it's not addressing the underlying problems, which is the infiltration of these gangs at the highest level of the Ecuador's government, the judiciary, etc., which has allowed them essentially to control the country. If you don't solve those other issues, this will not be enough. It's a short-term victory. Alessandro says there are also concerns about the means with which that short-term victory is being achieved. There are grave concerns, obviously, about huge human rights violations that are happening, that could happen, and that, obviously, more violence will only bring more violence. There's also the fact that Noboa seems to be copying some of the strategies of El Salvador's Bukele, who has become sort of this influencer strongman that everybody is calling because of his success in El Salvador. The country's young, media-savvy president, Nayib Bukele, declared war on gangs, imposing emergency security measures and giving police sweeping powers of arrest. Thousands are now behind bars and the country is transforming before people's eyes. But Ecuador is a much bigger country than El Salvador, and also El Salvador's gangs are poor compared to the organized crime organizations here in Ecuador that are backed and supported by the big international cartels. And there is a major worry and risk that they will respond to this crackdown. Alessandro believes the president faces a lot of challenges, but ultimately has support from the Ecuadorian public. People are giving him the benefit of the doubt. Previous governments did put in place a state of emergencies, but didn't um, go 
a full out against the gangs like Noboa is doing with this decree of an internal war of defining the yeah, a number of gangs as terrorist organizations which essentially has allowed the army on the streets and to sort of jump the usual precautions that exist but they also feel that Novo is very young that he doesn't have a lot of experience and he hasn't really done much in terms of presenting a long-term plan on how to deal with this in particular when it comes to reducing the influence that the gangs have but for now he definitely has a window of opportunity and he has the political support and the support of a majority of Ecuadorians to present a plan and to try to win this war in a sustainable way that could bring stability back to the country. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Ashish Malhotra, David Enders, and Sonia Bagat, with Khaled Sultan, Zaina Bezer, Amy Walters, Nagin Oliayi, Siria Al Khalili, Veronisa Campana, Miranda Lynn, Chloe K. Lee, and me, Malika Bilal. Alex Roldan is our sound designer. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back.